welcome. You are listening to Zeal Fear House. I am your host, David Murray, and I'm joined with Dorothy Carruthers. Her focus here is on our relationship with our Heavenly Dad and all aspects of His kingdom, moving in greater intimacy with Him. Additional teachings, books, and articles may be found on my website at www.dwmurray.com. That's dwmurry.com. Again, thanks for joining us, and let's get rolling with this week's broadcast. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us once again on Blog Talk Radio uh, with Dorothy Carruthers. This is David Murray. And Dorothy, unless we've missed a connection, I'm assuming you're still with me. Yes, I am. It is good to hear your voice again, Dorothy. I know you and I stay in touch, but it's been so busy. I felt like you and I even haven't connected. And uh, it's great to to be back on the air again after taking a couple of months off. And so for those of you tuning in, guys, to help you understand a little bit of the body of Christ, uh, how I function, uh, and why sometimes I'll dip out once or twice a year, particularly around the holidays and sometimes um, in the summer or fall, is our responsibility. And for those of you men out there that are listening, um, you know, I hope this ministers to some of you. Our first responsibility is to our spouses, then to our children, to our family, then to our local brothers and sisters that we're meant to serve, and then the body of Christ uh, is as large as the sphere of influence that God has given us. And so sometimes <clears throat> throughout the year, the Lord will tell me, David, you need to step back. You need to, to pour into some other areas that, um, that are, are priorities as being a priest of your home and being um, the head of your household. So I spent some time getting refreshed, uh, spending some time with the family, and uh, spending some time ministering to the local assembly here in our community in New York. Um, there's there's just a, a ton of need everywhere, but New York is particularly challenging for for its own reasons. And I am so blessed and honored to be part of the body of Christ, <clears throat> a fellowship that I meet with some wonderful individuals that are truly are like my brothers and sisters in every sense of the word. And so um, I took some time off to uh, to get refreshed in the Lord and with the local assembly a lot. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting back into full swing with things. I had toyed around, guys, back and forth to discussing either whether or not to give uh, some prophetic insights into 2019 and kind of recap in the last couple of years. Um, but as I was preparing for that study, the Lord corrected me on some areas, got a course correction, and told me I first have to address something else. Uh, and it's in regard to the doctrine of the remnant <clears throat> uh, that has to be addressed because until we can come into biblical alignment, it will skew our perception, our understanding of the role we have to play um, as God reveals pieces of his heart, pieces of his mind, will, and intentions, right? That's the definition of prophecy, uh, the heart, mind, will, and intentions of the Lord revealed, hidden things revealed. Uh, he desires to reveal his heart and to share his heart with his children. Um, to the degree that we will understand that and flow in it has a lot to do with our identity. And part of our identity has to do with coming up with understanding the remnant. So uh, I'm going to be speaking about that, Lord willing, in the next week or two. Tonight we're going to be talking about who are the remnant. Three things. What's the definition? What place does it have in the new covenant? Remember, guys, a lot of times when we refer to the remnant, we're always going under uh, a covenant that has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. The scriptures say that all things were types and shadow, but the fulfillment is found in Christ. No covenant uh, had the Holy Spirit living inside the person who received Christ as the final ultimate sacrifice. The new covenant is where the Holy Spirit came and now dwells inside of us. He left heaven to live inside the church, live inside us individually and express himself when we gather corporately. So what place does this, this term, the remnant, have in the new covenant? And who are the remnant? I think that's a question that's on a lot of people's hearts and minds because I hear 
uh, a lot of people, when I look at different um, blogs, when I go to different um, YouTube channels, and I, and I just try to keep my pulse, and the Lord leads me to different things to see what areas the bottom body of Christ is excelling in and what areas the body of Christ is struggling in. Um, one of the things that I see that a, a large part of the body of Christ are struggling with is um, fear. There is a lot of fear going on uh, in the hearts and minds of the body of Christ. <clears throat> and that's our first indicator that there's a problem because the scriptures say perfect love casts out all fear. Those that are in fear are not made perfected or complete or fulfilled in the love of God. So there's an issue in the body of Christ. And we're going to hit that tonight. Um, before we get into this, it's very important first that the listeners, that brothers and sisters, you hear the heart of the Father. The reason why there is so much fear in this hour and why there's so much self-centered living is because the church has not been instructed by the elders of this generation. We have failed to teach on something that was meant to be a foundation of the new covenant. The foundation of the new covenant is the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is that he has come and is restoring back to God's children what Satan robbed. And the way that that's being restored is by making his children blameless and holy, accepted, forgiven, and adopted as sons and daughters. The church as a whole does not understand this. We have no clue, even when we quote the scriptures, if we do, which are seldom quoted, we have no roadmap, a bridge of how to get from the scriptures that say he has made him who knew no sin to be the righteousness of God, meaning we've been made the righteousness of God through Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Right? My blog is entire sections that go about all the scriptures that when we accepted Jesus as the forgiveness of our sins, what was given to us was the gift of being completely accepted by Father God. The lie that's being taught, which is leading to fear, is that in order to be accepted, we have to perform before God. That is a demonic doctrine. And it is robbing the children of God from experiencing peace in this hour. When Jesus said, I will give you peace, when Jesus told the apostles, you're going to be persecuted, and every one of them, with the exception of John, was martyred. They walked in manifest and manifold peace. Here, we're not even being martyred in the United States, and we have no peace. So there's a big problem. And the problem is we're not being taught that we are accepted in the beloved. That's Ephesians 1, 1, 1, 6. He has made us accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in Christ. We're holy and blameless. We are sanctified. sanctified. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, by which we are sanctified. That word sanctified, guys, in the Greek means to be made the same nature of God. That's not based upon performance. That's the way Father sees you because of the blood of Jesus. Guys, we have to stop and think. When we take communion, what's the difference between the blood and the bread? The wine and his body. There are two different aspects of communion. The blood is forgiveness of sins. It's being made holy. It's being placed in a perfect standing in Father's eyes. That is, the scriptures make it very clear he died once and for all. Please read the book of Hebrews and Romans. Those were written so that we would not fall into the end times deception that many of us have fallen into. That's that the, 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 the blood of Jesus Christ covers all past, present, and future sins. And so what many of us do is we go, right, well, does that mean we could just sin, do whatever we want? Guys, we sure can. The, the blood was for, for the forgiveness of sins, guys. That's past, present, and future. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews and the book of Romans centers upon the issue of sin and the issue of a blood atonement, a blood sacrifice being needed. And they were satisfied once and for all. We've got to get out of the Old Testament, guys. We need to start reading the epistles and reading the Gospels and seeing the earth ministry of Jesus. If we want to start entering into the peace and the rest and the love of God that's been shed abroad in our spirit. The scriptures say we have the love of God inside of us. It's locked away in our spirit, man, our souls, 
where the wounding lies, our mind and our emotions, have not experienced a lot of the love of God because we're, we're rejecting it. We're holding on to lies that we need to earn his love and earn his approval. Because of that, because there is so much fear, we are listening to doctrines that tell us we better be part of some sort of remnant, otherwise we're going to be left behind and experience the wrath of God. Guys, this is demonic theology. It's demonic. It's not found in the New Testament. Please hear me. Everything must be taken in balance and in context. You guys have been listening to me for a few years. You know, context is everything. The Old Testament is interpreted in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ found in the epistles and the gospels. I am not saying that God's loving correction, which some people call wrathful judgment, Right? Judgment, the wrath of God comes upon sin. If man has not accepted Christ, they fall under the wrath of God because sin is attached to their identity. I'm not talking about um, the loving discipline or the wrath of God that will come upon sin. He lovingly corrects his children. Wrath comes upon sin. And we have been fall, fallen to this fearful doctrine that we better be counting one of these remnant or God's wrath will fall upon us. Guys, that's demonic in the name of Jesus. I tell you, you need to begin renouncing that if you want to come out from underneath the condemnation of Satan. If we are living in fear, we're living contrary to what Christ promised us, and it means our theology is off. Our relationship with God needs correction. And this is his love for us. He wants to pour out understanding what it is to be his son. Okay, so this is good things. So what we're going to be sharing, guys, is not, and there's no condemnation in this. This is meant to release life. We have to understand we have embraced this remnant church theology because we think somehow we're going to escape the wrath of our father who's really ticked off at us. And it's because we're being taught by those who are called to be elders who claim to be elders, false doctrine. I'm not saying there's not judgment coming. The Bible makes it very clear it is. I'm not saying he doesn't lovingly discipline his children because the Bible makes it very clear he does lovingly discipline. But wrath does not come upon God's children. You will not find that in the New Covenant. We need to get out of the book of Daniel and get out of book of Revelation, and we need to start looking at the earth ministry of Jesus. Guys, he spent three and a half years on the earth to show us the Father who's invisible. We're rejecting that because we don't know how much we're loved and we're turning to this remnant idea thinking that maybe we can beg enough and plead enough and, and become Pharisees enough so that we can avoid the judgment. Crazy theology. The Bible warned about it in the end times. Guys, I'm not into sin. I'm not into reaping the fruits of sin. Galatians 6, 8 says if we reap to the Spirit, we're going to, if we sow to the Spirit, we're going to reap the kingdom of God and all the gifts and fruits and blessings of it. That's got my name on it. Right? That's what I want. That's my heart's desire. Number one, I want intimacy. I want to feel the presence of God in, through, and around me, and I want to give that to everyone I come in contact with. It's the love of God. The scriptures say we love him because he first loved us. Galatians 6, 8 starts saying if you sow to the demonic realm, if you sow to the physical, the, the God of this world, right, the carnal realm, you're going to reap death. I have no interest in that. So me personally, I'm not looking for an excuse to sin. Guys, talking about the goodness of God, anyone who has their head screwed on straight is not going to look to sin as a result. They're going to look to embrace that because it's the goodness of God that transforms us, Roman 2 tells us. We're not to despise his goodness. We're to embrace it's his goodness. They're to want to change. Do you want to hang out with an abusive spouse, abusive friend? No. If you have someone who's a wonderful friend, a wonderful spouse, don't you kind of want to hang out with them more? Right? Why don't we apply that to our walk with God? Why do we look? If you have a wonderful best friend uh, or spouse, if they treat you really well, is the first thing you think of, well, let me see how poorly I can treat them and get away with? That's crazy, right? We'd say that's, that's 
kind of foolish thinking. Yet we apply that same darkened thinking whenever we talk about the goodness of God. Talk too much about God's love, we're going to start sinning. Yeah, it doesn't motivate me to sin. And I know for many of you, if you think about it, it's not going to motivate you to sin. It's craziness. It's a revelation of how much he loves us that draws us closer to the light and the flame of his love. Get into this, guys. We're going to keep this short to the point. There's a benefit of hearing this again. I'm going to be throwing out a slew of scriptures in context so that you guys can all be blessed by this and have the opportunity to dig into some truth that will set you free. Okay, what is the definition of the remnant? Well, it, it starts, the word starts under the Deuteronomy law. Long before the Israelites ever even rebelled or thought of rebelling, God, who sees everything, talked about a remainder. It means which is left over or has escaped something. Okay, that's what the term remnant in the Old Covenant means. Talking about when you guys rebel, meaning to the Israelites, when you rebel, my hand of correction will come upon you. I have a plan for the nation of Israel, and through the nation of Israel, all will be blessed. And because the redemption of all mankind is coming through Israel, I have to make sure that Israel is going to be the light it's meant to be. They messed that up. God went on to plan B because that's how much he loves his children and said, I'm going to redeem my children no matter what. That's where the word, the remainder of the remnant came from. And, and the prophets, as time went on and Israel got into demonic worship, the prophets hearkened back to Deuteronomy and hearkened back to what the law said in regard to a remnant being left over, a remnant being saved so that Jesus could continue to fulfill his promise to come through Abraham's seed. Okay. Question two, topic two, what place does it have in the New Testament covenant? Right, guys, we have to remember, we don't live under the Noahic covenant. We don't live under the Abrahamic covenant or the Adamic covenant. We do not live under the Davidic covenant. And we do not live under the Mosaic covenant, the law, the most popular covenant. We live in the best covenant, the new covenant, the one where all the other covenants pointed to, where Holy Spirit is in us and has changed our hearts, changed our minds, changed our thinking, or is supposed to, because the power to do so is now in us. We're in a new covenant. Okay. So let's read a little bit. Let's start getting into some scriptures. Guys, nowhere in the New Testament is the phrase remnant anywhere in the New Testament used to refer to a group of the body of Christ that will be spared of something. Nowhere. Now, I know many of us have our pet scriptures, and I'm familiar with them. None of them refer to a group of the body of Christ being spared. But the principle of a remainder remains intact. Principle, guys. The principle is there will always be a small percentage of his children that seek after his heart, seek after the testimony of Jesus, and desire to fulfill what's on his heart and seek intimacy with him. That's a remnant. There will always be a small percentage of people that give him permission to heal the wounds in their hearts, heal their fears, renounce the demonic lies that we've been taught, and press on to the prize, the high calling of Jesus Christ. There's, in every generation, there has been a remainder, a small portion of God's born-again believers since the day of Pentecost that have sought what's on God's heart. The vast majority go their own way. They're in heaven. They've accepted Christ, and, and, and they've never renounced that. They're going to heaven. But they never entered into the rest, the fullness of intimacy, the full high calling of Jesus Christ. Only a small remnant in every generation have done it. There is a point where the church will all come to the fullness of Jesus Christ. 
There is a point coming just before his return when a great harvest will take place. I know a lot of people don't believe in it, but it's in the Word. And it's fulfilled in Isaiah 2, 3, and the New Covenant fulfillment is in Ephesians 4, 11. Ephesians 4, 11 says, Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge. That word knowledge means experiential knowledge. Knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Guys, that time will come. There will be a generation that casts off the lies of Satan, that stops living to seek the pet doctrines that are self-soothing, and we decide to let God heal us. That takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of bravery. But this is a, there is a generation that is going to seek the revelation of his love. And that love that flows from within inside the body of Christ will transform the body of Christ, bring us up into unity, experiential knowledge of the Son of God. Guys, that means walking with Jesus. That means visions. That means dreams in which Jesus sits down and talks with us. That means interactions with the heavenly host like, like the apostles did in the first century where they were so real, Peter didn't know if, he was, if it was happening in, in the natural realm or if he was experiencing a vision. That's how real and how often it occurred. That will take place, guys. The earth will not end with a, a, a remnant of people. Ephesians 4, 4, 11 through 14 make it very clear, we will come, the body of Christ, into the full measure of Jesus Christ. Then it says, verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind and teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Guys, Ephesians 4.11 makes it very clear. Paul, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit and his visitations with heaven, saw a generation of spirit-filled believers that will come forth in this new covenant until then, guys, every generation has a remnant, a small portion of Christians who will represent all the born-again believers that seek after what's on Father's heart. So the question is, who are the remnant in this generation? Right? That's the most logical question. Who are those that are seeking the things that God seeks? What defines that remainder. Well, the scriptures tell us that. We know exactly because the scriptures make it very clear. In the new covenant, the remnant of every generation since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the remnant are those where love is on the throne of their heart. They love more than they hate. They have a love for the Lord, a love for the body of Christ, and a love for the lost. Qualify to be amongst God's children that are remaining faithful to what's on his heart. Remember, if we're going to be remaining, we're remaining from something. Jesus, in his earth ministry, told us everything that was on Father's heart. A lot of us don't read the gospel anymore. A lot of us have no idea what's on his heart. Because we've been sold lies that make us feel afraid and fearful and think we need to work on our external behavior instead of seeking what's on his heart. Jesus made it very clear. Here's what's on Father's heart. Love is on the throne of their heart. They love the Lord, love the body, and love the lost. Number two, they have their affections set on Father's heart. Number three, they have a passion for fulfilling the great. And number four, they do not have a care for their own life. Four qualifications to be included among those who have remained faithful in this generation to what's on the Lord's heart is that love reigns in their inner being, reigns. Love for the Lord, for the body, and for the lost. They have their affections set on what Father's affections are set on, which means you have to have intimacy to know what's on his heart. They have a passion for the Great Commission being fulfilled, and they do not care for their own life. They lay down their life, not interested in self-preservation. 
let's get into this, guys. We're going to move quickly because I want to keep this short. I don't want to drag this out. And I want you guys to be able to meditate on this. Just soak it in. Listen to this again and again, guys, if it, if it ministers to your heart, this truth. Number one, so throne is on the love of their heart. They love more than they hate. Mark 12, 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. All right, love for the Lord. Teen 14. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And then he reminds them again, right after that, guys, what he's commanded us. Remember he said, a new commandment I give you, love one another? Well, in John, so that's in John 13. He then later on says, you're my friends if you do what I command you. Well, what did he command them? Well, he goes on to repeat it again. He says, this is my command, love one another. See, the remnant understand that the commandments of Jesus are not about works. Jesus isn't looking for self-righteousness. He gave us his righteousness. He doesn't need our own. That's blasphemy. It's demonic. That's what Satan said. I will exalt myself above the throne of God. And we're attempting in this generation to exalt our own identity and worth above what God has given us. Right? The remnants are those that love. Okay, Romans 13.8. Be under no obligation to anyone. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. 1 Peter 4.8, above everything, love one another earnestly. Guys, that Greek word earnestly, look it up. That's a tough one. That's, that's a tough one. It, it is a, the Greek is so awesome. There's so much, it's such a deeper language. Uh, the word earnest there means an absolute fervency, sincerity. Above all, love one another earnestly because love covers over many sins. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, do all your work in love. The remnant do not do their work in self-righteousness or fear. They do it in love. 1 John 4, 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in union with us. And his love is made perfect in us doesn't say we're not God's children if we don't love. It just means we're not in union with him. We're not connected to what's on his heart. We are sure, verse 13, we are sure that we live in union with God and that he lives in union with us because he has given us his spirit. 1 John 3, 18. My children, our love should not just be in words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. The remnant love in action. Remnant do not love in self-righteousness. Their actions are an outflow of the love that's inside of them. Guys, those that are remaining faithful to what Jesus said are those that have allowed the Holy Spirit to enter into them and begin to let him heal our wounds. It starts with forgiveness. It starts with saying, hey, what does God say I am as his child? All right, well, if I don't feel that, if I fear fear, if I feel like I need to earn his love, somehow re-earn salvation, one of the greatest demonic teachings going out here, we have to try to struggle to be a remnant to re-earn something from him so we're not swept away with the judgment. As we're going to go on to talk about, the remnant don't care if they live or die. They don't care. It's not on their heart because they realize they're, they're not citizens here. The body of Christ the few and far between in the body of Christ that are laying down their lives that don't care about it have no care for this world as Jesus commanded them. We're going to get into that. So number one, we love from the throne, what's on the throne of our heart. Let me break this down. So that's, uh, let's get into love for the body of Christ, guys. Let's put a finer point on this. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, Jesus gives the whole parable of the sheep and the goats. I won't read the whole thing, but you read it. Matthew 25, 31. Jesus said, if you give a cup to one of my children, you've given it to me. Enter into my rest. He goes on to say, depart from me, because when I was thirsty, you gave me nothing. Right? And their response is, Lord, what are you talking about? And he says, if you didn't do it to any of my children, you didn't do it to me. Right? Jesus said, 
that we are to love the body of Christ. We are to love one another. The remnant are faithful to that call. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one part suffers, talking about the body of Christ, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So not if one part is honored, the other parts are jealous, looking to find fault, looking to find hidden sin to denounce them. The remnant love, and we're in unity. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, meaning modest parts, guys, he's using an analogy of of where we cover up our our, um, private parts. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Guys, that's a lot of information on how we're to love and treat and honor and view one another. Hebrews 10.25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Guys, fellowship is not a rule. It's an honor. It's a blessing. But if we don't love one another, there's not going to be any desire to fellowship. Matthew eighteen twelve. the parable of the hundred sheep. Right? What is this parable about? It's going after the backslidden. Jesus says, will you not leave the 99 sheep and go after the one that what? Has gone astray. These are the backslidden, guys. Those that have remained faithful to the words of Jesus preached 2,000 years ago love the backslidden. They don't hate them and judge them. Guys, there is a spirit of hatred that is all over the body of Christ in fulfillment of Jesus' prophecies that in the end times the love of many will grow cold. Only the church has been equipped for the love of God. Only the church has the love of God shut abroad in our hearts. The remnant have not forsaken the love of one another. They love the backslidden. They live the parable of the shepherd who left the 99 to go get the one. Moving on, love now, love for the lost. Luke 10, 25, the parable of the good Samaritan. Right? This is in reference, guys, when the Lord said, I love this whole portion, how the whole, all, everything fits together. Right? Jesus goes on to saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. These two sum up all of the law and the prophets love the new covenant the power of god the ability to love has now been placed inside of you so you have this self-righteous guy listening to this and says oh yeah lord well who's my neighbor and jesus goes on to tell the story of the good samaritan for those of you that study the samaritans right you know the jews hated samaritans this parable absolutely was so offensive to the self-righteous. It was, self, it's, it was offensive even to the Jewish community because the Samaritans were despised because their theology was a mess. And Jesus says, those are your neighbors, the lost ones, the ones that are deceived, the ones that have mixed theology with demons. Those are your neighbors. You're to love them. You're to love your neighbor. You're to love the lost. To be counted amongst the remainder, those that are faithful to the words of God, we have to love the lost. Jude 23, save others by snatching them from the, fire, from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing, not the person, the clothing stained by corruptible flesh. Guys, we hate the clothes, or said another way, we hate the sin, not the lost. Matthew 12:31. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. Remember, guys, your neighbor was described as Jesus as the Samaritan who was lost. He was not in the covenant of Abraham. Guys, in our history, all throughout history, 
Since the inception of the New Testament church, every century there have been those that have been martyred for the sake of trying to save the lost by sharing with them the testimony of Jesus. This generation right now, while we're listening live or after the fact, born again Christians are being martyred for the sake of the gospel. Not here in the U.S. No. But all throughout the world, Christians are being martyred for sharing the gospel. They have remained faithful to the words of Jesus. Moving on to number two, guys, and we're going to move quickly. We're halfway done with this. Have their affections set on Father's heart. Guys, the remnants, those that have remained faithful to Jesus, are dialed into his heart. Colossians 3, 2. Set your affections on things above, not on things on earth. 2 Timothy 2, 4. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Guys, if we're not filled with peace, our minds are not walking in the mind of Christ. We have turned away. We have become unfaithful to what the Holy Spirit told us is the way to intimacy, is the way to peace, is the way to union with God. Galatians 1.10 Am I now trying to win the approval of humans or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. doesn't mean we're not born again. It just means we're not serving the Lord. The remnant, those that have remained faithful, are servants of Christ. They serve him. They're not afraid of what man thinks. They're not looking to find worth and validation and identity. They're not bound by the fear of rejection, the fear of failure, the fear of punishment, or the fear of being shamed. Guys, one of the greatest indicators of fear in our soul is the degree that we are angry, judgmental towards others, and feel shame toward ourselves. I'm going to say that again. One of the greatest indicators of fear residing in our soul is the degree we're angry, judgmental, and feel shame toward ourselves. It tells us we're out of alignment with the living testimony that lives inside of us. He's locked in our spirit, trying to set our hearts free, trying to heal us. He's inviting us into intimacy, guys, in this generation. Number three, a passion for filling the Great Commission. This this is something that the Lord has spoken to me about um, The Lord and I have spoken face-to-face on this that is grieving his heart is that much of the church and much of the church in the United States have rejected what's on his heart. We have forsaken the words he told us when he left and gave us the Holy Spirit. Those that have remained faithful to his words in this generation are those who fulfill Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, remember, this is at his resurrection. Before he died, in John 15, what did he say his commandments were? Love. We have to remember that, guys. Remember, we've been taught false doctrine that his commandments mean we have to act a certain way in order to be counted as the remnant. The degree that we don't sin is the degree of our righteousness. It's blasphemy. We're made the righteousness of Christ because it's a gift. We can't earn it. The entire book of Galatians is Paul correcting the body that got twisted by a Gnostic doctrine thinking you can earn righteousness. And we've come full circle to the Galatian, the Gnostic deception that we can somehow earn being his remnant, not by anything that's inside our heart, but by outward works of a pharisaical, self-righteous spirit. That's not the remnant. Guys, this isn't me talking. Sure, I'm just sharing with us what Scripture is so it could set us free. There's no condemnation in this. The truth sets us free to begin entering into his love and the fullness of walking in the spirit realm. 
Let's keep going. Fulfillment for the Great Commission. Jesus went on to say, it's repeated again in three of the four Gospels and then in Acts. That's how important it was. Mark 16, 15, he sends them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Does Jesus want them to be condemned? No. That's why he said, you go and get out there. There's plenty of harvest. There's very few workers. Luke 14, 23. It's a parable. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Acts 1, 7, and 8. And he, Jesus, talking about Jesus, said, it is not for you to know the times and seasons for the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Talking about the day of Pentecost, guys. You receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Guys, what are we witnesses to? Stop and think about that. We are witness to Jesus, witnesses to the written record, testimony of Jesus inside of us, which says, Behold, the kingdom is at hand. Guys, the testimony of Jesus is that he has come and given back to man what Adam forfeited. He has redeemed us and restored us into intimacy and fellowship. Guys, this is the testimony of Jesus. This is what we're to share. This is the good news. That's the word gospel. means good news. It's the testimony of what Jesus gave back to his children. Final point, number four. The remnant do not have a care for their own life. John 15, 13, greater love. Everything, guys, goes back to love. Greater love is no man than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. Romans 5, 7, and 8. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is our standard, the love of Christ. Remnant of those who live by the standard of Jesus. Revelations 12, 11. They triumphed over him, meaning Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Guys, these three, three scripture verses that we just read, John 15, 13, Romans 5, and, and Revelation 12, they're, all three are expressions of love, love for God, love for the church, love for the lost. And all three of these involve laying down your lives physically. Here in the United States, and in a lot of parts of the world that get polluted by the U.S. doctrines, the neo-modern false doctrine movement, right, is everything's fear. Well, how do I know if I'm going to be saved? How do I know? How do I know? No talk of the commission. No talk of loving the church, loving the lost. We say we love the Lord, but we're not in union with him. We don't have intimacy with him to the degree that we don't love the lost, love the church, to the degree that we're not seeking after the Great Commission, which we'll only have a desire to do if we understand how much he loves us. Freely you have received, freely give, Jesus said. And some of us may stop and think, well, why? Why aren't we hearing about this? Guys, because we're not teaching New Testament theology. We're not teaching the testimony of Jesus Christ. We're teaching self-preservation and self-righteous works and saying, if you can attain to these things, just like the Pharisees said in the first generation, that's why they hated Jesus so much, guys. It was so demonically twisted, they couldn't stand the freedom and the liberty Jesus was offering. In the same time today, there are many of us that hate the teachings of love and forgiveness because it upsets our fearful theology we've created that we can think somehow we can earn something from God. We want to do things our way. Guys, it's only because we've been taught lies. Is Jesus coming back? You betcha. Is he going to judge the earth one day? You bet he is. Does he hate his children? No, that's demonic. We just got to do reading that, that while we were sinners, he died for us. That is love. While we were sinners, 
Elsewhere it says in the scriptures, we were alienated and enemies because of our wicked behavior, wicked works. But now he has reconciled us in the body through his flesh to present him holy, unblameable, and beyond reproach in his sight. That's Colossians 1.21. Guys, you starting to see how all this fits together? Right, so summary, what is the definition? It came from Deuteronomy. It meant that which remains or is left over. Uh, what place does it have in the New Covenant? Uh, it doesn't in terms of only a few Christians being left over. It doesn't exist in the New Covenant. What does exist is that Jesus gave us a new law. Love the Lord and love his children with all your heart. Love is the New Covenant law. Puts on his heart. We are to fulfill the commission to redeem as many of his children. It breaks his heart when one of his children goes to hell. Breaks his heart. But we haven't been taught that, so we don't really care because we don't really know if he loves us. Well, would God really, would he shed a tear really if I went to hell? No, we don't believe that. That's why we think we need to beg and plea and cry. Guys, I can't tell you how many times I go on to some of these broadcast and the, the comments are just, oh, Lord, please save me. Please count me worthy to be among the remnant. It's, um, there are prayers that come from not, not knowing the Bible, not knowing theology, being taught lies. And God wants to set us free from that. He loves us too much. So let's start with this challenge, guys, to begin picking up his love and how much he loves us. Guys, on my, my blog um, website, dwmurray.com, dwmurry.com, no matter what I teach or share about, whatever prophetic insight I give, the balance of the covenants, what's required of us to fulfill what's on God's heart, everything is union and partnership, and it's loaded with scriptures that point us back to Jesus. I encourage you, please visit my website, get into the word, mouse around, look at different things, see what pricks upon your spirit and upon your heart. I guarantee you, as you read some of the stuff that's on there, you will not want to sin. The love of God will get a hold of you. I know that because it's one of my places in the body of Christ. Guys, there's a a cost that I've had to count. I very rarely share on some of these things, but I'm going to today. There is a cost. I have paid to be able to sit here and share with the body of Christ. There was a cost. It cost me a lot. It cost my wife a lot. But as he got a hold of my heart and I saw the revelation of how much he loved me, I said, Lord, send me because I love your church. I love your lost And guys, that's what he's calling us to. And that comes out on the pages of what I shared. It's not about me. Every member of the body of Christ should be pointing each other to the throne room of Father's heart. So in summary, the remnant or the remaining who have been faithful to what Jesus commanded for the end times, love reigns on their throne, love for the Lord, the body, and the lost. Number two, they have their affection set on Father's heart. Number three, they have a passion for the Great Commission. Number four, they do not care if they live or die. Because life here is a plank, and it's meant to be enjoyed no matter what. The apostles knew that, and they were hunted down to the ends of the earth until every one of them except John was killed, murdered. And they walked in such love and power and visitations And they brought untold people and nations to Christ. Now all of them, all of them are rejoicing in heaven. And guys, the host of heaven are cheering you on. They're not condemning you. They see the darkness we live in. And they're saying, go for it. Lord Jesus stands from his throne and says, come to me. Begin to to seek and find out how much I love you. And guys, it will transform us. So, 
Love, guys, releases the power of the Holy Spirit in us. That's what transforms us into, into, into his image. Guys, then we will naturally, or said more accurately, supernaturally love as he loves, feel as he feels, and carry out what's on his heart. He's not looking for self-righteous. He's not looking to see who's going to be saved from anything. He's looking for intimacy. He wants you to know how much you're loved. Guys, I know this is a challenging word. Believe me. <laughs> Believe me. When the Lord was talking about that, we, we had some conversation about this. And I understand the fear that this kicks up because we've placed a false, false security in thinking we can shame ourselves and grovel enough to escape some sort of wrath that he holds toward us. Guys, in the name of Jesus Christ, I tell you that is a lie. It is not found in the new covenant. We took about 45 minutes, 50 minutes to go through the scriptures in context, in context, to see what was on Jesus' heart and what he gave us and told us before he left. He says, when the Son of God returns, will he find faith on the earth? He is coming back. And we have a job to do. And the number one job is to get to know him. He died for intimacy. Everything else is an expression and outflow from that. So I'm going to close out with that. I'm not going to be too verbose. Dorothy, thank you as always for the honor and the blessing of being permitted this platform to speak. It is going on three plus years now. And it is my honor to serve the body of Christ through some of the few things the Lord places on my heart to share. So as always, Dorothy, thank you. There's a cost that people don't realize that, that you have. And thank you for all your support and your friendship over the years, Dorothy, as you've seen the Lord taking me on my roller coaster ride as well. So I am honoring you, Dorothy, as my sister in the Lord before the body of Christ tonight. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a very good word. And I think one of the things we need to do as a body is figure out what the word love means. Um, I think all too often we think it's just an emotional feeling. It's a lot more than that. It's a choice. So... Yeah, um, maybe sometime I'll teach on that. Um, you know, I try to touch on that really r regularly. Uh, and the best way to say it, guys, and we'll close out, because I really want you guys to digest and just listen to this broadcast as many times it'll minister to you. Go visit my website. I got no GoFundMe there. <laughs> I got nothing, nothing there except love. <laughs> All right? There's not, nothing else but love there, guys. Um Guys, love is a, the nature of God is love. God's very nature, his kingdom is built upon love. And the foundations of his throne room, um, righteousness and justice, are on the bedrock of love. It's, it's, it's a, it is a very nature. You know, some people, we get bent out of shape because the new age tries to rob everything. And the more Satan steals our words, the more we, we forfeit what's ours in the kingdom and we just allow the counterfeit. Right? And I've heard someone explain it as liquid, and I get why that's squeamish, because usually people that say that are the wackadoos, right? They're into all sorts of weirdness. Uh, but if you can picture something like honey, right? This guys, so many places think about it. It talks about the love, the anointing, the presence of the Holy Spirit as oil, as honey. Right? So guys, if we say water or honey, right? Water is scriptural. Honey oil or scriptural. They're tangible manifestations to help us grasp a spiritual reality. Guys, nothing in this realm is more real than the spirit realm. If the oil represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what do you think the reality is when we begin to experience that in the spirit realm? Guys, when we experience the, the fellowship and intimacy of the Lord, it is much greater than imagining oil being poured out over your head. Because everything in the Bible, the scriptures say, are types and shadows, but the reality is found in Christ. The type and shadow is never greater than the reality. It's a shadow of things that were to come. So, 
I'll leave you with that thought, guys, to chew on that. What does that mean? <laughs> anyway, I love you guys. Dorothy, I love you. God bless you guys in the name of the Lord. I hope this ministers to some of you. <clears throat> Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, just love you guys. God bless, Dorothy. We'll catch up and um, hopefully be back in a week or two to then begin discussing some insights on what Father is doing in this season into 2019. So, you know, clear up some, a lot of things and, and you know, let's get our hearts established on, on what's on his heart. So God bless, guys. Thank you. Have a wonderful night, weekend. And for those of you listening after the fact, God bless you where you are. Know that you are loved. Good night, Dorothy. Good night, David. Father bless everyone. This has been Zeal Fear House. I'm David Murray and I'm joined with Dorothy Carruthers. We were hope that you were blessed by this week's broadcast. Again, if this was your first time, please stop by my website at www.dwmurray.com. That's D-W-M-U-R-R-Y dot com for additional teachings and insights. God bless you, and until next time, please dare to accept the fact that your heavenly dad loves you deeply.